work, working miracles, flattering people. He doesn't come in by war, but by peace. And the whole world wonders after him, thinking, you see, he is supernatural. He can perform miracles in the sight of man. And they're going to worship him thinking it is Christ. It is a real sad state of affairs when God wrote throughout the word of God warning that this would happen. And yet seldom is it ever taught. Again, so simple a child can understand. And yet people refuse, they wish to listen to flyaway doctrine, even though in Ezekiel chapter 13, beginning with verse uh, 20, God himself said, I am against those that cover the knuckles of my saving arms and teach them to fly to save their souls. I'm against that. I would think that you'd want to break away from any falseness. Because if you want to believe the lie, God will send strong delusion. He'll, he'll help you have a good trip if you refuse to accept the Word of God over the traditions of men that make void the Word of God. Your choice. Returning to Daniel chapter 11, let's pick it up with verse 37 as we continue. Neither shall he regard the God of his fathers nor the desire of women, that's to say the bride of Christ, nor regard any God, for he shall magnify himself above all. Written here in the Old Testament and in the New Testament, second witness that the false one will do this, claiming to be God. The real sad truth is many people will think he is. Why? They haven't studied God's word. They haven't studied to div rightly dividing, showing themselves approved and they are deceived. And if they want to be that way, God will help you along with it. It is punishment within itself. <clears throat> the millennium is going to be a sad day for some when they wake up and realize they didn't take part in the first resurrection. He's going to stand there. He's going to claim to be God above all gods. And he's come to fly you away to his own little kingdom I got some bad news for you. His kingdom's a hot place. Be careful. Listen to your heavenly Father, not traditions of men. Verse 38. And in his estate shall he honor the God of forces, and a God whom his fathers knew not shall he honor with gold and silver and with precious stones and pleasant things. It's going to be a sweet papa to everybody, every religion on earth. It, I mean, it won't, it, things desired is what it is. Whatever your desire is, he's got it. He's got it for you. That's what he'll tell you. 39, thus shall he do in the most strongholds with a strange God whom he shall acknowledge and increase with glory, and he shall cause them to rule over many and she'll divide the land for gain. That is to say for a price. Uh, the price is worshiping him. You can have anything you want as long as you'll worship him. You can have all of his money you want as long as you receive his mark. That is to say to worship him. But you have the seal of God in your forehead and you're not going to fall for that monkey business. You know better. Your father loves you. You stay true to him. Don't be deceived and do not take play, part in the great apostasy. The word apostasy means for one to give up his professed beliefs in one instant necessarily and change to something else. In other words, if you love the Lord Jesus Christ, you're a Christian, and you don't know the difference between the false Christ and the true Christ, the minute the false Christ sets on foot claiming to be Christ and you accept him, you change that quick. You change from worshiping the only begotten to worshiping the devil. Do you see the seriousness of that? It's going to happen to many people. And it, and it is a sad state of affairs when God makes it so clear and so plain in the prophecies concerning, he even draws it out here telling you these are the last days and this is how it's going to happen. And they still will not read. 
they will not learn. Verse 40, and at the end, and, and at the time of the end shall the king of the south push at him, and the king of the north shall come against him like a whirlwind with chariots and with horsemen and with many ships, and he shall enter into the countries and shall overflow and pass over. This is one worldism. They simply give in. 41, he shall enter also into the glorious land, and many countries shall be overthrown, but these shall escape out of his hand, even Edom, that's Rush, Russia, and Moab, and the chief of the children of Ammon. In other words, those that love him, they escape anything uh, contrary or chastisement. Why? Because he's already got them. Already got them eaten right out of his hand. In other words, you must equate this to one worldism or you're going to get hung out to dry in this. And these wars are spiritual wars in a sense. And if you're one of God's elect, you're one of the warriors on the good side, witnessing against the falseness that Satan tries to put upon our people. And will, he shall. The the thing is, you must prepare yourself to know that a, a majority of people will follow him. But that doesn't mean it's right. The majority is most always wrong. When you follow God's word, his instructions, you're righteous, meaning you're always right. So be very careful in these end times. The wars after he enters peaceably are spiritual, basically. It's playing with the minds of people. And certainly those that have already, a, a, an atheistic nation that drives God out of the midst the moment they see the false one performing miracles, he's got a meeting out of his hand. No problem whatsoever. And that really is only the start. Let's go with the next verse, 43, I believe it is and um, 42, and he shall stretch forth his hand also upon the countries of the land of Egypt, and the land of Egypt shall not escape. He will take it all. One worldism again. He will be all gods to all people. That's why it said he will not even the God of gods. He becomes all things, all things desired. You want it, he'll get it for you. And many people will grab it. They'll go with it. Verse 43, But he shall have power over the treasures of gold and of silver and over all the precious things of Egypt and Libya. The Libyans and the Ethiopians shall be at his steps. All of Africa covering it over. It's one worldism. Worldwide and, and uh, taking advantage of those that would. Now, let's recap where we're at here just a moment. We had history to Daniel from verse 1 to 4. We had future to Daniel, but history to us from verse 5 through 20. In verse 20 and 21, we had the, the vile one appeared, that's to say the false Christ. After that, the reason he can enter peaceably is because he comes in religiously and becomes uh, the religious head of all religions. This is, this is what makes the one worldism complete. They will all worship him that are not written in the Lamb's book of life, that is to say those that truly love the Lord and are of God's elect that no one understands what's about to befall. And our Heavenly Father will have this come to pass at the right appointed time and exactly as it's written. It isn't that difficult to follow. And then we see much chicanery when we came to the verse 25 and 26 that they'll go to a table but they'll lie to each other, mislead this one grabbing here and one there. But 
Don't worry, Big Daddy will smooth everything over and give everybody everything they want. No quarrels because he's there. But yet at the same time, man shows his own wickedness by, by offending and uh, insulting. But Big Daddy will smooth everything over. The God of forces. He'll force everything upon everybody. And they'll love it if they worship him. We that do not worship him, he will not say very flattering things about you, but that's well and good. Do you know why? Because God will love you. It's much better to be loved by the living God than by Satan. But you see, the reason I'm recapping a little bit, the choice is yours. You're the one that must make the choice whether you're going to believe God's word or man, man's traditions. Man's traditions are, you don't have to understand God's word, the prophecy of the end times, you're gonna be gone. Now, hold on a minute. That's not what Paul said in 2 Thessalonians chapter two. He said, our gathering back to Christ will happen after the tribulation of Antichrist, after he stands in the holy place claiming to be God. What are you gonna do during that time? I know what you're going to do if you're unlearned. You're going to think it is Christ come to fly you out. And you're going, to, you're going to worship Antichrist. That's Satan. What a miserable, sad state of affairs for one to allow themselves to be put. Well, I didn't know God would do that. God said, I, in the ninth verse, tenth verse, of 2 Thessalonians, I will even, if you want to be deceived, I will even see that I send strong delusion to you so that you believe the lie. Uh, he'll, he'll, if you want to fool yourself, he'll help you. I, I, and, and you know, our father loves his children, but he doesn't love what they do many times because they won't listen to the simplicity in which he teaches but they prefer the traditions of men. Let's go with the next verse, verse 44. But tidings out of the east and out of the north shall trouble him. Therefore, he shall go forth with great fury to destroy and utterly to make um, a way. In other words, it's obvious who these troubl troublers are. It's the bruisers, it's God's elect. Because as it is written in Mark chapter 13, what you say will not be you speaking, but the Holy Spirit speaking through you, both sons, both sons and daughters. And this bothers him because he has everything under control, the whole world eating out of his hands. Then he has this group of bruisers. They, bru they don't bruise anyone but Satan. They're a pain in his side because truth always outs. And as it is written in Luke 21, the reason he is so upset and the reason he tries to make away with is because the true God of gods told him, you can't harm a hair on their head in Luke 21. And he would say in Revelation chapter 9, verse 4, don't you dare touch mine elect. Don't you try to touch those that have the seal of God in their forehead. In other words, Satan can't touch them. And that's where the pain in his side comes from. That's why he is ever so troubled. The whole world is worshiping him. He has all the precious things in the world. And here, are these elect of God that are nothing but a pain in his side that they keep being trouble, trouble, trouble. And he finally decides, I'm going to do away with them. I think if you understand prophecy, probably what he has to do is he slays the two witnesses or has them killed. That's his downfall. God told him, don't you dare touch them. Three days later, the true Christ returns and all things are made right. So he signs his own sentence when he attacks the two witnesses as it is written in Revelation chapter 11. 
they are God's anointed. And God said, touch not mine anointed. One more verse to finish the chapter. Chapter, verse 45, And he shall plant the tabernacles of his palace between the seas and the glorious holy mountain. Yet he shall come to his end, and none shall help him. God's not going to help him. No one else is going to help him. And when the true Christ returns, the very sword from his own mouth will destroy the fake. And so it will be. How precious it is to serve the living God and to know we have the victory. This one that is so pompous, this one that is so deceiving, this one that even deceives the whole world, you can better understand why when he is placed in the pit, as that other place in the Old Testament so describes, Isaiah chapter 14, he is placed as Lucifer, son of the morning, son of the morning, he claims to be the morning star, is truly Christ, not him. He goes into the abyss, and people through the millennium will walk up to that abyss and look in and say, is this, I mean, I'm quoting scripture now, is this the man that deceived the world? You mean this poor, miserable wretch that's it bound in with the bands of God is the one that everybody in this world followed? How disgusting it is, but how true it is that these things will come to pass and this generation of the fig tree will see it come to pass. So there is no excuse to be deceived for God helps those that help him and just a little help from God goes a long, long way. I call the Holy Spirit speaking through us when we're delivered up before the synagogue of Satan a lot of help. I consider it a big bunch of help that God loves his children enough that even in those conditions, he sees that the true word of God comes and naturally it troubles the wicked one because, you know, he really feels he's good enough. If he can get the whole world to worship him, he'll just turn himself into God and everything. It'll, it'll be forever. He's, he's supernatural, <clears throat> but it won't happen that way because of the bruisers, because of God's elect, but most of all because of our Heavenly Father and his love for his children, those that do follow him. You know, when you look around yourself today and you wonder why so few of God's elect were chosen from the first earth age when Satan rebelled and the whole world hoard after him, and when you see how few people today truly in-depth study God's word, then it becomes pretty obvious why the world will be deceived at that time and why it was deceived in the first earth age. You see, it's real sad that most people, the Christian, which should be taught about the first earth age so they can intelligently understand the Word of God, they don't even know there was an age before this, even though science itself documents it over and over and over. But then also God's Word documents that there was an earth age before this at Satan's fall. Yep. He's going to plant his tabernacle right in the holy place, claiming to be God. And unfortunately, and his message is just exactly what people are expecting, and that is his mark. I've come to fly you away. And he will take many souls that think they're saved. And there is no, you know, anyone that has any conscience at all knows you can't worship Satan and be saved by the living God. Got to be some adjustment to the attitude, big time. And the embarrassment of having worshiped the false one when you have to face the true one is so embarrassing, most people can't even handle it. Many of them will pray for mountains to fall on them. See that you're not in that position. We'll finish this great book of Daniel in the next lecture. Don't miss it. You listen a moment, won't you please?
Good day to you. God bless you. Say, welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel. Welcome to this family of Bible study arm back in our Father's Word. We're going to complete the book of Daniel today, <clears throat> the very 12th chapter. That's the end and how precious it is. It's an interesting chapter. Some people make it very complicated, but just let it flow. And um, it's, it's um, the final chapter, and it kind of caps off. It's the frosting on the cake of prophecy concerning the end times. Now, um, Daniel, what does it translate? My God is judge, and he is. That's why you never want to judge anyone. Let God be that judge, and you teach his word chapter by chapter, verse by verse. Never, never, never apologize for the word of God. <clears throat> Having said that, let's get right into it. Chapter 12, the great book of Daniel, verse 1, and it reads with that word of wisdom from our Father. And at that time, that's the end, shall Michael stand up, the great prince which standeth for the children of thy people. You want to know who the prince of Israel is, God's people? It's Michael. And there shall be a time of trouble. Don't for, you know what time of trouble that is? We've studied it many times. Jacob's trouble, such as never was since there was a nation, even to that same time. And at that time, thy people shall be delivered. Every one that shall be found written in the book. This is why it is ever so important that you, on repentance and loving the true Christ must see that you're, the book of life whereby your name is clear, that you've repented for not some of your sin, but all of them, so that you have a clear page there, because those that are in the book are going to take part in the first resurrection. God is going to protect them, just as he used the example in this book of Daniel of the three Hebrew children, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They were protected in that fiery furnace, when this trouble that is worse than anything you've ever seen on this earth, you're going to be just fine. God's going to take care of you just like he did those Hebrew children. That's why chapter 3 was placed in here, so that you know you can trust our Father. He's not angry at you. So naturally, his tribulation does not come against you, but for you. Just as Daniel was in the lion's den, God took care of him. So. Always remember that. He did that to encourage you to trust Him, love Him, know Him, that He is able to take care of His own. And why you can, when you read the 21st chapter of Luke, and it states that when you're delivered up before the false Messiah, they can't harm a hair on your head. Why? Because God takes care of His own. If you're in the book, if you're one of His elect, that's what makes it so very, very precious. You know, let's go to this day of trouble just a moment. You're not going to have it. I'm going to read it to you. Jeremiah chapter 30, verse 7. Listen to it. Alas, for that day is great, so that none is like it. It is even the time of Jacob's trouble, but he shall be saved out of it. You don't have to worry. That is, if you trust the Lord, and if you know he's able, verse 8 of that same chapter, for it shall come to pass in that day, saith the Lord of hosts, that I will break his yoke from off thy neck, and will burst thy bounds, and strangers shall no more serve themselves of him. There is a time that being a Christian and following the true Christ, all the shackles that the world tries to place upon you, controlling prayer days and so forth, Boy, are they going to, you know, we're in a basket, hell in a basket, boom, just like that. They're going to get theirs, and they're going to get it all at one time. It's a bad day for them. It's a beautiful day for us. Verse 9, But they shall serve the Lord their God and David their king, whom I will raise up unto them, that is to say, Messiah, and he shall come at that seventh trump. 10, Therefore fear Thou not, O my servant Jacob, even though it's Jacob's troubles, don't be afraid, saith the Lord, neither be dismayed, O Israel, for lo, I will save thee from afar and thy seed from the land of thy captivity, 
and Jacob shall return and shall be in rest and be quiet and none shall make him afraid. You don't have to be when you're a servant of the living God. You and God make a majority. Don't ever let them see you sweat in these end times and, and know and understand that God is with you. And don't be afraid of God not knowing what's going on. He certainly does. And he pays very close attention. Jacob's trouble is, is a terrible trouble for our enemies. But it's a beautiful time for us. It's a great shaking, but we're not the ones that get shook. You know why? Because as it is written in the 12th chapter of the great book of Hebrews, you're standing on the rock which is to say Christ, that cannot be shaken. Heaven will be shaken and the earth will be shaken. But when you're standing on that true rock, nothing will shake you. It'll survive anything. Why? Because God loves you. And God always takes care of His own. Now, continuing on back to chapter 12, the great book of Daniel, verse 2. And many of them that sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life and some to shame and everlasting contempt. Now, this is probably one of the most misunderstood verses in the Bible. It truly is. Because we know from Ecclesiastes chapter 12, verse 6 and 7, the instant you die, the instant that silver cord parts, you die, your spirit, which is the intellect of your soul, meaning you and your spiritual body, instantly return to the Father. Now, then what is this that sleep in the dust? It's a statement of degradation. In other words, they are spiritually deader than a hammer. And, and you know, you shouldn't have any trouble today understanding that because how many people do you know that you can sit down with and have a real intelligent discussion on the Word of God, the coming of the false Messiah, and what it is we're supposed to do. How many people do you know that you can have that conversation with intelligently? Because they won't, otherwise they will never understand what you're saying. Why? They're spiritually deader than a hammer. It is true that they will be changed into a spiritual body at the seventh trump but they will still have a mortal soul. And a mortal soul is liable to die. That's what the word mortal means. Well, what do you mean, brother? I mean, if they don't change their way through the millennium, they're going to hell. And most, in as much as most of the world whores after the false Christ, there's going to be quite a, quite a bunch of them that had better change their ways or... There, um, this is why you want to know, as it is written in Revelation chapter 20, we covered it, remember chapter 20, verse 5, where it said, The rest of the dead must remain dead until the end of the thousand years, and we as priests shall reign with Christ a thousand years. Well, what does a priest do? You teach. Well, who are you going to teach? Well, naturally, you're, not, you're going to teach those that need to be taught. And hopefully, they'll see the truth. The dead there, the word dead, you need to know uh, in the Greek the difference between, between nikros and nikros because it, it's not a corpse dead. They're spiritually dead, dead in a hammer. So here we have this statement, well, what about this shame? Well, if you'd sit on a church pew all your life being spoon-fed by the brethren, and you finally were not, you were never warned about the false Messiah coming first. And all of a sudden, here he appears saying, I've come to rapture all of you out of here. And you run to him thinking it is Christ. And then you find out, I mean, being a good Christian person, supposedly, worshiping Jesus, you think, but you end up worshiping Satan. What kind of shame is that going to be? That, that it is hard to even imagine the shame of a Christian to realize all of a sudden they're worshiping Satan and here comes the true Christ and what are you going to say to him? I didn't know. No, you should have known he wrote you a letter. He explained it all in detail. 
of exactly what would consummate the end of this age over and over, just like in this book of Daniel, this shall happen at the end, the latter days, the latter time. You either believe the word of God or, or you don't. So therefore, you're without excuse and that shame will, it will abound. And if you ever want to be thankful for one thing, that shame and everlasting contempt is something you don't want any part of. So rightly divide God's word, study to show yourself approved, and read these instructions God sent along telling us how to work these flesh bodies, whereby we attain salvation, and our name is in that book of life, in good standing. Verse 3 to continue. And they that be wise shall shine as the brightness of the firmament. Uh, and they that turn many to righteousness as the stars forever and ever. In other words, God's elect will always try. They will always set that example. They will also, when someone needs a, a seed planted of truth to change lives, they'll plant it. Uh, verse 4. But thou, O Daniel... Shut up the words and seal the book, even to the time of the end. Many shall run to and fro, and knowledge shall be increased. You know, that's, that's a nice sounding verse, but it's incorrect, okay? Uh, you with companion Bibles, you, you will understand that a resh was confused with a delete, and it made the word wickedness turn out to be knowledge. To and fro, as it is given, means running to and fro, bringing about the great apostasy, the deception. So I'm going to read it the way the ancient Septuagint and many of the ancient writings have it, and especially with the Masara correcting the Resh from the Delith, then this is as it should read. Be thou, but thou, O Daniel, shut up thy, the words, seal the book, even to the time of the end, Many shall run to and fro, and wickedness shall be increased. And it will be. It's going to grow worse and worse because Satan will be here and he will be deceiving many. Verse 5. Then I, Daniel, looked, and behold, there stood other two, the one on this side of the bank of the river and the other on that side of the bank of the river. Now, where are they standing? Where's Daniel? Well, he's at the Tigris River. And one is standing in Iran, and the other is standing in Iraq, which was Babylon of old, and Iran being Persia of old, right in that geographical location. That's where this is taking place. You want to keep your eyes open, and you want to observe current events and be able to understand the connection between prophecy to better understand just how things go down. And what are these two delivering? Verse 6, And one said to the man clothed in linen, which was upon the waters of the river, How long shall it be to the end of these wonders? What, what is this question? How long will it be till the end of the world? One, probably one of the most asked questions ever asked is people wondering, when is the end going to be? When will this transpire? Okay. So that's what they're asking him. And, and so it is. This has reference all the way back to the 10th chapter and the 14th verse by Hedekal, which is Tigris, okay? Verse 7. And I heard the man clothed in linen, which was upon the waters of the river, which he held up his right hand, when he held up his right hand, and his left hand unto heaven, to swearing to Almighty God, and swear by him that liveth forever, that it shall be for a time, times, and half. And when he, who is this he? The Antichrist, the little horn, Lucifer, the dragon, when but the role of false prophet and antichrist, when he, that false prophet, shall have accomplished to scatter the power of the holy people, all these things shall be finished. And, and so it is. You'll, you will 
you will all remember back to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, we just covered it recently, where we're together, Paul was a little concerned about the first letter to the Thessalonians, but that any moment we're going to all be changed, they, they, they took it wrong. And he wrote in that second letter, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, this is how we're going to gather back to Jesus Christ. It will be no other way. Don't let any man deceive you. It will not come to pass until after he, this same he, the son of perdition, stand in the holy place claiming to be God and showing the world that he is God. And all the people that want to believe that lie, God will send them strong delusion and let them believe the lie. It's a testing time. Make sure you don't get caught in that trap and bring as many out of the fire as you can, of the fire of, of deception. That, that is the work of God's children. Three and a half years, that's what he's talking about here. We know that that's half of this, the 70th week that we learned of in the chap, ninth chapter and the 27th verse. But even this has been shortened, and we know that also. We know exactly what it's been shortened to. Uh, well, how do we know that? Well, Revelation chapter 9. Uh, and Christ would say in Mark 13, For the elect's sake I have shortened the time when the Antichrist is here, or no flesh would be saved. And he shortened it to a five-month period, as it is written in Revelation chapter 9, and following verse 4 concerning, Don't touch mine anointed, and he can't. That means you, Satan, when he's here as the false Christ, cannot touch you. You even have power over him. Don't ever be afraid to utilize that power in the name of Yeshua Messiah, Jesus the Christ. Uh, verse 8 to continue. And I heard, but I understood not. It didn't make sense. Then said I, O oh my Lord, what shall be the end of these things? In other words, Daniel himself, in all his wisdom, could not understand that. Even after the ninth chapter, where we went into much detail about the false prince, the true prince, the cutting off of Messiah, and the length of time that the desolator would come in the middle of the week. That's why the three and a half from dividing seven in half. Uh, all explained to him, but here he's a little foggy on it. He doesn't quite understand what that has to do with that actual end coming. Let's go with the next verse, verse 9. And he said, Go thy way, Daniel, for the words are closed up and sealed till the time of the end. Now, what does that mean? Well, it means at the time of the end, whenever that is, the word's going to be opened, and the wise are going to understand. And that is why it is paramount that one takes the time. No one will ever know the instant, no one will ever know the day, but the wise will understand the season. That is to say, the season of the, the fig tree. That's why Christ would say in Mark 13, I don't want maybe you to learn the parable of the fig tree. Learn it, that's what he said. And you had better have learned it. If you have trouble with it, then you need a little help. Get my work on it. The fig tree and that parable, it start, well, where did it start? Well, what did Adam and Eve cover themselves with when they had sinned in the garden with Satan? Fig leaves. Understand the parable of the fig tree. Know what happened in the garden. Be not ignorant concerning God's letter to you, especially in these end times, to know and to understand and to make clear the season. Verse 10, continuing. Many shall be purified and made white and tried. We're going to keep teaching right up to the last minute. But the wicked shall do wickedly and none of the wicked shall understand, but the wise shall understand. There you have it. Those that are wise in the Word of God and have that clear understanding, 
you, you can you can understand and and um, the word of God. You can understand and ascertain as to what part of it even pertains to you. And that in itself is a beautiful thing to know and to understand. You are told many times throughout the Word of God exactly how it's going down. You are told in Mark 13 that just before the end, the false Messiah will appear. He didn't say maybe the false Christ will come. He said the false Christ will come first. Don't you believe him. If they say he's in the desert or wherever, don't believe it. Don't go there. Why? He's a fake. Over and over you are warned. Matthew 24, the same thing. He even says not only will Satan be there, but his false angels, the Nephilim fallen angels, are cast out with him, and they're going to be giving and taking in marriage again, just like they were in the days of Noah. You see, warning after warning. And... And um, those that do, don't understand God's word are going to walk right into the trap. And as, again, in repeating myself at the risk of repetition, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 9, God said, if you want to believe the lie, I'll help you out. I'll send delusion upon you. I'll help Satan fool you. If you won't read the letter of love I've sent to you, and you can understand that. Father's jealous. He's a very jealous father. And that jealousy, if you have give re the thing you want to do, is never give him reason to even be jealous of you. Let him know you love him. Dig into that word. Understand that word. Well, I, I just have a little trouble with it. Well, then pray for wisdom. That's what you have the Father for. If you have trouble understanding, talk to him. Tell him you want understanding. Pray for it, and he'll touch you. He will assist you. He always has. Now, I want you to understand what we're about to go into, and I don't want you to make it difficult. I'm not, even, I'm not going to show any numerics or anything else. I'm going to just talk you through it. And I want you to listen carefully. Don't make it difficult. It's, it's simply a, a very simple mathematical problem to get you to the season, not the day. So with that, let's go with verse 11. Verse 11. And from the time that the daily sacrifice shall be taken away. Well, now, now wait, wait, wait. When was that? You know when it was, it when Christ was crucified. No more animal sacrifice. It's sacrilegious to sacrifice an animal after Christ shed his blood for us. Hebrews chapter 10, making that absolute. So what we're saying here, when, well, when did that happen? A.D. 33. Some people will say 29. Some will say 30. Some 31. I say 33. And for the sake of this problem, so it is. 33 A.D. From 33 A.D., the abomination that maketh desolate set up, there shall be a thousand two hundred and ninety days. Now, in Daniel's days, well, when was the order then that the, according to the fig tree, if you've learned that parable, it is set up to receive the Messiah. It happened in 1948 when, when Israel became a nation again. If you've ever read Jeremiah chapter 24, that's what concludes and brings the uh, parable of the fig tree to a conclusion when you see that. So, from the year 33 A.D. to the year of our Lord, 1948, there is the equivalent of 1290 of Daniel's days. Well, what do we do with that? Well, you find you a common denominator to be able to transfer Daniel's days to our years. It's all laid out for you in a very simple way. Well, how do I do it? All you have to do is to divide 1290 into 1915 because you have to take 33 years, the date of A.D. of Christ's birth, away from 1948, and it means there are 1,915 of our years from the taking away of the daily sacrifice 
to the order going forth to rebuild Jerusalem. Set up. The set up is very important because that's when the order went forth. So it's 1915 years. So you simply divide 1290 into 1915 and you find a common denominator of 1.48. In other words, there are 1.48 of our days, years rather, of our years in one day of Daniel. I will say that one more time. Christ was crucified in the year 33 A.D. The order to set up went forth in 1948. It was June to be exact if you want to be, but that's still not going to get you the exact date. And, and there it was in 1948, so you subtract those 33 years from 1948 to come up with the equivalent of 1915 of our years to 1290 of Daniel's days. Therefore, dividing 1290 into 1915 years of ours, we come up with a common denominator of 1.48, 1.48. Now, let's go with the next verse. Verse 12. Blessed is he that waiteth and cometh to the thousand three hundred five and thirty days. That's thirteen hundred and thirty-five days. Want blessed to come to them, come to make it through, to see you're not deceived by that time. Now, well, how would we do, what would we do with that? Well, you would take the common denominator, 1.48, and multiply it times 1335 to see what the date came out. It's 1982. On Pentecost Day of that year, Mount St. Helens erupted, and an awesome thing took place. As God would say, in the end time, smoke and fire will come up from the earth. And the time of Elijah would come at that time the turning of the children's hearts back to the true father or the fake father. One or the other people go. It's according to what they hear and what they know. So there is nothing difficult about that. Now, a lot of people would say, well, the order actually went forth, but the main order went forth in, in 1967 in the Six-Day War. Well, if it, if it tickles your fancy, you're still in the same season. But if I remember right, you would come out somewhere around 2012 with that equation. But you're still in the season. That's what's important, is to know we're, we're at that door. For Christ said in Mark 13, when you see that parable of the fig tree, when you see the shoot set out, then all prophecy would come to pass before that generation would pass away. So you're in that time. That is not a difficult um, problem in mathematics to understand the season. God is good to us and he gives us that. It is not for one to make a religion out of. It is not for one to, to go bonkers over but to be, you are a watchman, and when that season of watching comes forth, you are exactly supposed to do that watch. Final verse to complete the chapter, verse 13. But go thy way now until the end be, for thou shalt rest and stand in thy lot at the end of days. And certainly Daniel would. Daniel was chosen by God used by God, and even in Ezekiel chapter 28, when he was dressing down Satan himself as the king of Tyrus, he said, you're wiser than Daniel. That's how wise Daniel was. But again, don't ever forget who gave him that wisdom. It was our Father. It is our Father that gives you wisdom when you need it. And when you have difficulty understanding something, ask him for clarity. Ask him for understanding. That's why he gives you the scripture. That's why he gives you the equation. So that God's word is simplified for you. 
And that that might seem difficult, true wisdom is to simplify it where anyone can understand it and deal with it. That pulls many souls out of the very fire itself and brings them into the grace of Almighty God whereby they fit the very final line of the verse, first verse of this chapter, chapter 12, verse 1. Deliver every one that shall be found written in the book, the book of life. Is your name there? If you understand Daniel and love our Father, and serve him, I assure you, your name is there. And every time you repent, anything that is negative there is erased from it. Therefore, you are in good standing, and that is God's promise that you will understand and that you will find that salvation, that you will have eternal life. Book of Daniel, I hope you've enjoyed it as much as I've enjoyed bringing it to you. Listen a moment, won't you please? <laughs> 